Now, friends, it's that point in the meeting where we turn our attention once more to William Gurnall and Christian Complete Armour. We're dealing in that section, you'll remember, where he's concerned with the spirituals, the Christian spiritual shoe, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And having spoken at length about the nature of gospel of peace, he has come into a section explaining for us under seven headings how gospel peace prepares the Christian for suffering, how it prepares the Christian for suffering. Now, the first evening we looked at this, we took the first three and we saw that Gurnall uh, tells us that, first of all, gospel peace lifts the believer above danger in a very real sense. Uh, you remember the illustration he uses, if a man could be persuaded that he could walk as safely in flames of fire as he could stroll through his garden, he would not be afraid to do one more than the other. So it lifts a believer above danger. Secondly, a person at peace with God becomes his child. And uh, Gurnall was at pains to stress that the child of God knows that the father will not hurt his own child. Thirdly, we saw that a soul with God's peace is an heir of God and kinship to heaven carries that benefit, of course, and uh, brings blessing and assurance uh, with it. Then last time we moved on to look at points four and five. First of all, uh, point four, we saw that gospel peace actually makes faith invincible. Uh, pardoning mercy has turned the serpent of the law, as Gurnall puts it, with its threatenings of stinging the sinner to death into the blossoming rod of the gospel. Um, we read last time, you may remember that incident in <clears throat> Exodus, where uh, Moses uh, uh, it does exactly that with a rod. Uh, and uh, Gurnall applies it in that way. And it turns it into the blossoming rod of the gospel, which brings forth sweet peace, uh, fruit, which sweet fruit of peace and life. So gospel peace makes faith invincible. He also touches that on Psalm 32 and David. Then fifthly, last time we saw that peace with God fills the heart with love for Christ. Um, uh, I've got a little piece underlined here, um, particularly the heavenly fire of Christ's love, powerfully beaming on the soul, will put out not only the kitchen fire of carnal love, but also the hell fire of fear. Well, that leaves us with two points outstanding. Sixthly, Gurnall says, peace with God encourages self-denial. Peace with God encourages self-denial. Now, it goes without saying, he, he points out that self-denial is a grace so necessary. Um, uh, self-denial is something so central to the Christian life that it cannot be avoided. And self-denial is a grace so necessary to suffering that Christ lays the whole weight of the cross on its back. And he's thinking there of that verse that we read in Mark 8, 34, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, some, like Simon of Cyrene, he says, may be compelled to carry Christ's cross after him only a short way. But the self-denying saint, imbued and strengthened with the peace of God, will stoop to his knees and wait for Christ to lay this burden on him. Now, says Gurnall, there are two ways that peace with God empowers the Christian in the kind of self-denial which prepares him for suffering. Firstly, this one. This peace enables the Christian to deny himself his sinful self, to deny himself in his sinful self. Now, that's a, a bit of a, a heavy sentence, isn't it? But um, what he's saying is that um, the peace of the gospel makes a Christian able and willing to deny our own sinful hearts and desires. Sin may well be called self because it cleaves as close to us as our human body. It is as hard to mortify a lust as it is to cut off an arm or a leg. 
Yet, when Christ and the Christian feast, together with the hidden manna of pardon and peace, come together, he can ask for the head of the proudest sin of all and take it with less regret. And this is quite, uh, this is well, just a very typical Gurnall saying, isn't it? He can take it with less regret on the part of the saint than Herodias felt when she demanded the head of John the Baptist. There is no other key like love, Gurnall reminds us, to open the heart. When love knocks at the door and expresses kindness, there is little reason to fear rejection. And he turns back to the Old Testament and to the book of Esther. She persuaded her husband's heart against him and her enemy as she showed strong love to Ahasuerus at the banquet. Well, if that was so, says Gurnall, God demonstrates his love to Christians each time he entertains them at the gospel feast. Surely that is the particular time that he prevails with his children to send the accursed Amalekite of sin to the gallows and send it off for its execution. So gospel peace enables the Christian to deny himself in his sinful self. But he then says, secondly, and the two things are obviously connected, this peace also enables the Christian to deny carnal enjoyments. Now, <clears throat> to the same degree, the person burns in desire for worldly pressures, will he tremble in frustration when Christ requires him to part with him? Just as the sweet wines and dainty fare of a Capua eventually weakened Hannibal's soldiers, in the same way, carnal pleasures will weaken the boldest Christian warrior so he can no longer look his enemy in the face. Gospel peace deadens the heart of the believer to worldly temptations so that he can deny the most promising benefits the flesh offers. Now, the Apostle Paul is a great example of this, isn't he? And he touched on this in Galatians 6 in our reading, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know that Paul gloried in much. Before he was converted, he gloried in himself particularly. But now it is the cross of Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I, of course, unto the world. Galatians 6.14. His, his heart was dead to the world and the cross of Christ was the weapon which inflicted the lethal wound upon his carnal affections. I've allowed myself to go ahead of I've gone ahead of myself here as I sometimes do because Colonel then goes on to tell us there was a time when Paul loved the world as much as anyone else. But when God's mercy pardoned his sins and received him into favor and fellowship with himself, he abandoned these things to let the heavenly Lord and King reign with peace in his heart. No one can turn away from thirsting after fleshly enjoyments as fast as the person who has his mouth at the fountainhead, the love of Christ himself. A loving wife can forget friends and leave her father's house to follow her husband, even into a wilderness, at times even to prison. How much more freely then, says Gurnall, should a Christian say goodbye to life itself and follow Christ, especially when the comforter spreads the sweet presence of joy along his most lonely paths. So that's a sixth point, peace with God encourages self-denial uh, in the different areas in which that is called for. We come now to our final point in this section. Peace with God promotes the suffering grace of patience. It promotes patience. Suffering, says Gurnall, and I read this sentence a couple of times over really, is not grievous for a patient Christian. Now, he's not saying it's not difficult, but he's using grievous in that particular sense. It is not grievous for a patient Christian. In fact, patience has been called the grace which digests affliction and turns it into healthy nourishment. Weak stomachs prefer bland diets. But strong stomachs never refuse any meal set before them. All fear is alike to them. 
and there are some things which are hard for the spirit of man to digest. Reproach is very hard to digest. Prison, death, to name but a few. And he quotes there um, Matthew 13, 21. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. Usually this kind of hardship will not stay in the stomach of a weak, spirited person, but makes him throw up, and this is again a typical girl of comment, makes him throw up the most vital food he, shall, he should strive to keep, his profession of Christ. Sadly, there are many examples of that. The patient person, however, makes his meal of whatever God's sovereignty brings. If peace and prosperity are served up with the gospel, then he is thankful and enjoys the abundance while it lasts. But if God replaces these with the, the sour herbs of affliction and even persecution, they will not make him sick with despair. He simply eats the larger servings of the gospel. So his bitter herbs go down, wrapped up in divine comfort. And we'll quote that. I'm going to read that verse, that line again. He simply, the person comes, there's affliction comes. What does he do? Does he, does he refuse to take what is the diet? No, he simply eats larger servings of the gospel so that the bitter herbs go down wrapped in divine comfort. Christians then must rely on consolations that flow from the peace of the gospel if they are to be consistently patient people. It would be impossible for God's children to endure the persecutions they meet from men and from devils themselves without as help, uh, without the help of a sense of God's love in Christ, which glows at their hearts in inward peace and joy. In fact, the apostle reveals the secret of the saints' patience, hope and glory in tribulations. Romans 5.5, 5, you know the context, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Sin, on the other hand, makes suffering intolerable. A light cart, says Gurnall, moves over the marsh easily, but once weighted down with a heavy load, sinks until it stops. In the same way, guilt loads and overloads the soul and makes it bog down in suffering. But when the cumbersome weight of guilt is lifted, when God speaks peace to the soul, the person who once raged like a madman under the cross will carry it in a very different attitude. It is worth repeating here, Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, friends, that completes that section. How often have I said we're coming to the end of this book? Well, we really are this time because there is only one week's worth left in this volume, but there is another one awaiting us. So he has some final thoughts on this and we'll take that up if we're spared in two weeks' time.